So today, basically what we're going to talk about is um, talk about concepts in Buddhism. And I deleted some of the concepts because I thought uh, they weren't necessary, but I thought we would go through some of the core concepts. So we don't need to do that because we did this last time. Okay. So uh, fundamentally, all Buddhist schools have one main goal, no matter what school of Buddhism we come from. And, and this is actually true, not just of Buddhism, but Hinduism, J uh, Jainism, many of the Eastern religions, enlightenment is the focus. So not to go to heaven necessarily, not to... Um, not necessarily to be a good person, but the primary goal of Buddhism, at least this is my interpretation, is to try and gain enlightenment, right? So whether you're from a Tibetan school or a Vietnamese school, Chinese, most of the focus is enlightenment. And then the question becomes, well, how do the different schools differ? And in the very traditional Theravadan schools, the enlightenment is just for yourself, right? You're trying to gain enlightenment, the clarity of thought, um, to become one with the ultimate true reality for yourself. So what is enlightenment? Yeah. Right. So, that, <laughs> so I, I think... That's a goal. What is the goal? What is that? Yeah, so enlightenment is to be able to see reality as it really is, the true reality. So not from our own egotistic perspective, not from our own perspective, but to be able to see, for example, uh, this cup, you know, what is that cup? Well, for me, that's a white ceramic object, but from another perspective, it's a bunch of atoms, right? Uh, there's so, so what is that in reality? What is that truly? And can we ever, and so the whole idea, and that's what we believe the historical Buddha 2,600 years ago attained, is the ability to become truly one with the ultimate truth, right? To be able to actually be able to see the ultimate truth. So who defines what the ultimate truth is? Well, and so that's, um, so if, if there's someone defining it, then that can't be the ultimate truth. <laughs> Right. Whatever the definition you put on it or whatever the understanding you put on it is a perspective. Right. And so that's the difficulty is trying to um, try to figure out. And, and people say that if you understand what enlightenment really is, then you're enlightened. But is it somebody's perspective? No. Somebody could say, so, somebody could say that's my true reality. I really believe that's a cup. Yeah, you know, right, but that's because that is a perspective of that person. It, it isn't, right? It can't be. Right. So you you should be just seeing like energy, then if. Sure, but even like, what's our concept or understanding of energy? Right. So it's really convoluted Obvious. or very yeah. difficult. You, you can break anything down, down, down. To energy, right? I mean, or, well, or yes. whatever. Yeah. Energy yeah. Of people, yeah. Feel. So that's that's why it's not so simple, <laughs> right? And so I think that's one of the difficulties is okay if that's the ultimate goal. If the ultimate goal is to understand what true reality is, or to become enlightened, if that's our goal. But if you can't really fully understand what enlightenment is, you know, it's kind of like trying to achieve a goal that we don't understand. Exactly. Right. So that's, I think, fundamentally one of the most difficult things in Buddhism. Right? It doesn't have to be constant. Either. No, and, and that's been said many times, that people have moments of clarity. Like, you know, we all do, right? It's at times we think, oh, I really understand this stuff. And then 10 minutes later, oh, no, I don't, didn't really understand it. Or just as soon as you say, I think I understand. This. Yeah, it's kind of like a, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So that's a very common saying. If you think you're enlightened, you know you're not. Right? <laughs> it's like golf. 
<laughs> well, that's an analogy that I use all the time. It's yeah. like that perfect shot, right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you golf, yeah. right? That you, yeah. I have decided it wasn't good in the years. Well, yeah, <laughs> but know. in golf, everybody talks about the fact that you hit that pure, perfect shot. And that's the one thing that will get you back to golf again. And you think that you can duplicate it every time. But the chances are that you'll only hit that pure shot once a round or once every few rounds. And yeah, so it's like when you're in the flow of something, you know, it could be, you know, kayaking or whatever it might be, where you really feel like, okay, you, and you lose sense of time, you lose sense of yourself often when you're in that perfect flow. And so it's kind of like that moment, but the problem is that we can never sustain it. Right, like it's the perfect golf shot. Well, you hit it once, you think the next shot is going to be perfect. Well, it never is. Sparring in competition, well, somebody else yeah. is better. better. Yeah. Well, yeah. Top of the world, but yeah. You get your perspective adjusted. Yeah. So I think that there are moments of enlightenment that we might all experience, but the problem is that we can't sustain it. So how do they do it? Where they they see the whole true reality, and that's that's. And that you sustain it that way. Well, that's the whole idea of the practices in Buddhism. So meditation, uh, it could be chanting, it could be reading the scriptures or the sutras. The whole idea is that you perform some kind of a practice so you can get closer to that state of losing your own perspective about being able to see reality. So that's why aestheticism was felt to be one of the practices. You know, if you starve yourself, if you make yourself to the point where you don't care about your own body, then you come closer to that state of enlightenment. But it's a difficult concept for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, my question was, what's enlightenment for you? But we sort of talked about that. Um, the other concept that I have a lot of difficulty with, and many Buddhist scholars do, especially in the Western world, is this belief about rebirth or reincarnation. Because like fundamentally, most Buddhist schools start off with the premise that you are reborn, that you have cycles of birth and death, that you may be alive today as a human being, but your next life is going to be a dog, right? And they specifically had six realms that you're born into. So the realms of the god, the demigods, the humans, animals, the hungry demons and hell. And it was said that you're suffering in, even as a God, you are in a state of suffering, right? Because of this idea that you're going to be born and reborn. Um, and that's where that concept of karma comes in, right? So if you do a lot of good deeds in this life, you go to a higher realm. If you do a bunch of bad deeds in your life, you're going to go to a lower realm. So that was what karma was thought to be. Um, and so enlightenment, they said, the state is actually to be able to escape this cycle of rebirth, of reincarnation, of being born, that you actually end up in a state or a mind where you don't actually have to go through the suffering anymore. Right? So that was a fundamental question. But, um, well, let me ask this. How many people here believe that you're reborn? That can be reincarnated. I do. I, I was always told that from yeah. early on. My mom always said, you're, re, you're, you're reincarnated. And, so and there are some schools of Buddhism, for example, the Vietnamese Buddhists and many of the Chinese schools that say, you know, you have to believe this. Like, this is a fundamental truth. But I'm confused if, if we're reborn. My mom always talked about going to Nirvana, born at day, and then going to the Pure Lab. Well, you're there to get reborn out of there? No. So that's like, so the, that's the whole the notion is is that going to the pure lad escapes that cycle is the theory. Oh, so what, what's nirvana then? So we'll talk about okay. that, but nirvana is sort of a state. Um, but well, let's okay. stick with rebirth or. But I thought everybody, when they died, became a Buddha. So what? That. Well, so that's our fundamental understanding is, is that because of the promises made by the Buddha, that's what happens. But then who goes into the 
the cycle. So it was said that the Buddha broke that cycle for everybody. Up until that point, there was this recurring cycle for most of us. And so it was felt that anybody who take enlightenment in their lifetime, right, wouldn't go through that process. But everybody else who wasn't enlightened will be will reborn as a dog or a cat or a, a god. Well, well, then what happened to the, when you die, you become a Buddha? And well, again, that concept became popular, one with Mahayana Buddhism, but more so with Pure Land Buddhism. So that's a concept of Pure Land Buddhism. If you go to the Theravada schools, they don't say that. They say that you are reborn as a dog or whatever. You go through the cycle of rebirth. And only when you attain enlightenment can you escape that cycle. So it has to be based on your own merit and your own power. Yeah, but then the, the rebirth is based on your deeds as to whether yes. you, you're a, 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 it is what good. level of you come back as. Yes, yeah, that was the theory. The difficulty is, is that most Western and modern thinkers don't believe in rebirth, right? Like, if you ask me, uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what happens when you die, right? Which is a question that none of us could actually ask. So I guess the fundamental question is, life, us, or energy? Yes. When we're done with this body, where does that energy go? That's we're a good... For an explanation right. as to where this energy is going to go. Right. And your deeds... This way you dictate what level you will your energy, where your energy will go is based on the things that you've done in your past life. Is yes, that that's correct. So there was a conference of uh, at the Buddhist Churches of America, and they actually were questioning this exact question. Do you believe in rebirth, reincarnation? And they actually had a panel of about uh, 20 ministers, and they asked each one of the ministers, do you believe this? And interestingly, over 50% of the ministers from Cat America, granted, so it's a little bit of a biased opinion, but over 50% said, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe that I'm going to come back as a dog or a cat or uh, that I'm going to live another life. That my energy gets dissipated into this world, so my influence continues. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to have another life, right? And that was interesting because that, that became a question because fundamentally, um, if you don't believe in reincarnation, could you be a Buddhist? And the feeling, of, at least of that panel, was yes, because obviously over half the ministers don't believe it, and they're Buddhist, <laughs> Chodo Shichu Buddhists in particular. So it's not a condition that is necessary. You don't necessarily have to believe it. You have to sort of come up with your own comfort level of trying to understand um, what happens to this energy force, as you said, right, when you die, right? Yeah, because um, that's really a, one of the fundamental questions of life. But it's all in your quest for your, your life. Right. So, so if you were to ask me, and again, this is just a personal thing, I believe that, yeah, there is this energy that's me, whether you want to call it a spirit or a soul or whatever, Um and when I die, I do think that that force, that energy gets dissipated into the rest of the world. And a practical way of thinking about it is that my influence, you know, I'm going to, part of me is in my son and my daughter, right? Part of me is going to be in my new grandchild. Uh, um, but it's not just that physical form. It's my influence as well. So the way that my son thinks, the way that my daughter thinks, um, you know, uh, all of that, those influences continue. But do I continue as a life force, you know, that exists somewhere here? I don't believe that. But I think that's up to, and that's the thing about Buddhism is that it says there isn't really a way of knowing that, at least not in our current life form. We can't know what's going to be in the next, like after we die. It's just not possible. And in Buddhism, they would say that's not critical. That's not critical for you to know that because you need to live the life that you need to lead right now. Whether you know whether you're going to be a spirit or a dog or whatever or not, 
So does it depend on how you live your life, what you come back as? Is that that was the theory. Yeah, yeah, that was the theory. So yeah, if you people. come back as a dog, you're... That means you did bad be... things in your life. <laughs> but or maybe good things, dogs. actually. Because well, because Some dogs will change their lives. Um, but when the dog dies... Yes. Does that spirit go back into the cycle? That's the That was the theory. That was the cosmology or the understanding of most Buddhist schools. Hmm. Yeah. Back is such a <laughs> and then that's and that's interesting because um, there is not actually a formal ranking of the realms. Like you would think the gods would be the closest to Nirvana, but they said there's a couple of stories about the god realm where they say the gods actually suffer more than the humans or or even the hungry ghosts suffer. Maybe they're more aware of exactly that's exactly which, yeah. because because they're more aware of what's happening in the world. They have a clearer understanding about what's happening to the rest of humanity or animals or whatever, so that they are closer to the suffering of the of the real world. So it's not ranked, which is interesting to me because I would think that there would be a ranking that yeah. animals would be lower than us, but many Buddhist scholars say no, animals are actually in the higher realm than us. So is it based on more on what you need to learn? Where yes. You, where, where so that, that, that's exactly right. right? So um, the ranking of the realms, if you're going to rank them, are based on how aware you are. How and, and so they would say that the gods and the demigods have more awareness or closer to the truth than we are. But by being closer to the truth, they also see more suffering. Anyway. So interesting question. Um, so I just touched on the concept of karma a little bit. Um, and karma is used in various different ways in Western culture. And the, the closest that I could think of with karma um, is that every action has an opposite and equal re reaction, right? Uh, Newton's third law. But really the concept of karma is that your actions have consequence, right? So whether it's in this life or your next life or whatever you believe, but every action that you take has potential consequences on other people, on you. So it's not just your speech and your actions, but your thoughts as well. So every time I think a bad thought, it has the potential to influence how I react with other people, even if it's just an internal thought. Um, and so, and there lies the uh, fundamental understanding that um, individuals are responsible for their actions, right? That you have to be somehow responsible and understand that what you do and what you think has consequence. Okay. Um, Another fundamental concept in Buddhism is this whole idea of interdependence. Okay. So the fancier term for it is dependent origination or um, condition co-arising. But this whole concept is, and it's not a difficult concept. Uh, the concept is, is that we're here only because of consequences of many causes and conditions, right? So I'm here because of my grandparents, my great grandparents, because they came from Japan, because of the war, you know, Second World War, and they got interned, all, all of that. Um, but I'm only here because of the oxygen. If there wasn't oxygen in the world, we wouldn't be alive. Um, so many causes and conditions lead to our existence. And so nothing fundamentally exists on its own. I mean, that, and that makes sense, right? That's, a, I think, a scientific fact, that everything is interdependent. So that's the whole idea of dependent origination. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about nirvana. So nirvana is often equated to heaven, um, but um, that's sort of an interpretation of nirvana that's actually a little bit false. So nirvana is actually felt to be um, a state that you can achieve. So it, nirvana, in my mind, is equivalent to enlightenment. So once you achieve that clarity of being um, 
truly understanding the world as it is, that's the realm that you attain. Right? Um, and so in Buddhist, uh, in Japanese culture, they often talk about the pure land and nirvana as being like a heaven, right? So a place that you go to where the Buddha lives. And you, but I'm not, I think that's a very simplistic interpretation. And, and some people honestly believe that. I, I know my grandmother, for example, honestly believed that there is this place in the West, you know, a place where when you die, your spirit or energy force physically goes there and spends time with the Buddha. And then in, according to Mahayana culture, then you come back to this world to help other people. But she honestly believed that there was this place that her soul, her spirit, her energy, whatever, went to. So did we grow up with that? But we go to Nirvana, we were supporting that. We always had a service with Pasha and Jicha, and then it was like seven day, and then what's the 49th day was supposed to be the day. Wasn't it when they achieved that with Nirvana? Yes. The service? Um, so how do they achieve it when they say you can't really achieve Nirvana? Like, that it's, I guess that's the way they... So our understanding of nirvana is that we will all go or be in this state when we die. Uh, oh, okay. So, so is that right, Harry? Did we believe that? Like, the question? No, I don't. We always have service at 49. Really so um, let me clarify that, uh, Sachi, if, if you don't mind. So the seventh day and the 49th day is actually not necessarily um, a Buddhist uh, sorry, a Jodo Shinshu understanding of what happened. It was, it actually influenced Jodo Shinshu uh, from the other forms of Buddhism that existed before in Japan. So Tendai, uh, Jingon uh, Buddhism. Um, so they believe that um, in uh, when you go to Nirvana, um, that there's this transition. So the seven days are you go through the seven, six realms, and then the seventh day you actually go into the realm of the pure land. Okay? And that the 49th day uh, service was um, that, um, that it took 49 days uh, for that um, being that entity, your grandfather, or whatever, to ultimately get to that. Yeah, yeah, settled that in right. Get them there. In Hajodo Shinshu understanding, though, we believe, and this is what Shinran interpreted uh, with um, Buddhism, was that he believes that when you die, because of not because of your efforts, not because of your own karma, what you did in your life, but because of the compassion and the promise of the Buddha that you actually immediately are born uh, in Nirvana, that you immediately attain a state of Buddha or like right? um, And so this old notion of seven and 49 days actually comes from predates Jodo Shinshu. Right? But because it was a strong, such a strong custom in Japan, but also, I think, because of, um, so there was practical reasons why it also was retained. For example, the seventh day service was a way for the priests and the monks, whatever, Buddhist uh, ministers, to be able to visit the family on the seventh day to see how they were doing. Um, in Japan, for example, the tradition was is that if you had ran a business, you, won't, you weren't supposed to reopen the business for the 40, 49 days. Yeah, so you're supposed to actually be in mourning for 49 days. And then after the 49th day, then the life goes back to normal. I always understood nirvana to be a state of my mind. Yes. So beyond dying, it didn't matter anymore what was in my mind. Right. Yeah. Is that I, th I yeah. think so, yes. Yeah. I, I think most Buddhist academics, especially Jodo Shinshu, would say that nirvana is a state of being or a state of mind. Of, of this of physical your mind. human mind. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so 
you know, one interpretation was nirvana is the highest state that someone can attain, a state of enlightenment. Uh, so a person's individual desires and suffering goes away. So this is when you're alive. Or can, uh, when you're alive, so that state of enlightenment, at least according to Shinran, he said that most of us would have difficulties obtaining that state when you're alive, right? So in history, there were people who were felt to attain enlightenment besides the historical Buddha. But then I can go through the reasons why, but Shinran basically said, in this world, because of the way that we live and because of the way the world is, it's pretty much impossible for you and I to attain enlightenment yeah. based on our own self. But when you die, you immediately attain that state. It, you would lose that final desire to take one more breath. Yeah. Um, you needed it. And, and, you know, I've seen quite a few people die, like pass away. And in some individuals, there does seem to be that state of ultimate relaxation that, that you know I, I don't know how else to describe it but they become at peace fully at peace um and it can be moments before they die it can even be a day before they die um yeah so uh, anyways does that make sense okay. <laughs> no. it's more confusing now because it is. It's, it's, it's more confusing. Um, and so I guess the way that I would answer that is, is that um, one, it helps to so the more you study it, I think often the more people have clarity about, you know, enlightenment and all that. The three the enlightenment part where it says is so when you die, yeah, because you have no desires, you have no you're, 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 you're dead. dead. Yeah. yeah, you're dead. Like it's logic that you know that you don't have desires or have sure. Um I guess it though if you believe in a spirit, like if you believe in a soul, that soul potentially could still retain that, you know, selfishness or whatever you want to call it, ego or desire. You wouldn't lose that when you die? Like the, the well, so in some forms of religion, they don't believe that you lose that, that you still have that ego, that um, potential attachment. I guess like the Mormons, they believe they go to the planet and they have five legs, maybe, you know, so they believe that, right? So it's just like that then. Yeah. And we don't they go to where? Well, I don't know. They, I think they go somewhere, they, you know, their wives come oh. and join them. It's a big deal of that. Hmm. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the, again, what's considered to be fundamental teachings of the Buddha. And this first lesson was given as his very first sermon. So he attained enlightenment. He actually spent some time deciding whether or not he was going to be a teacher or if he was just going to enjoy his enlightenment himself. He made a decision that he was going to try and help others. And so he gave a Dharma talk to the five uh, um other followers uh, that he was practicing with. It was given in a place called Deer Park. I think it sh I showed you some pictures of that. Um, so, but he said that there were four fundamental truths to this life, that life is full of suffering, that the cause of suffering is our ego, that there's a way out of suffering, and that way out of suffering is the full path. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. So, the first question is, is life full of suffering, right? Um, and that's, again, something that is a little bit difficult to fully accept. Um, so if I ask people, is your life always suffering? Most people say, no, there's times when I'm happy. I quite, you know, if I see a really good movie or some pure good joke, I'm laughing. So it's not always suffering. But... I think that's not what the Buddha said. I think the Buddha said that there is suffering in your life, that there's going to be, that suffering, difficulties are, uh, I like this term, difficulties are inevitable. Suffering is optional. 
because it depends on your state of mind and your acceptance of that situation, even um, whether or not that difficulty is causing you suffering. Anyways, so an example is that when we're born, you think that's always a happy occasion. Well, for the baby that's born, that's a really tough um, journey, right? And the mother <laughs> the also. And the mother, <laughs> yeah. I don't know who it's worse for. Uh, um, death old age, sickness, you know, those are the fundamental things that we think, oh, yeah, that's examples of suffering. Um, but the Buddha also talked about things like separation from others, right? Like, uh, uh, I remember when my son was four, maybe five years old, uh, he would get together with his cousin, and Kyle and Nathan were really, really close, like they loved to spend time with each other. And I remember when Kyle left, Nathan was sitting on the toilet and he was just sobbing and he was saying, Kyle, Kyle, why did you have to go? Kyle? Um, so that is an example of uh, separation can cause is a suffering, right? Um, many things that we want, we can't always have, right? Um, we can't always do what we want, you know, like I'd love to be a pro golfer, but <laughs> never going to get to be that. Um, and then we often have to spend time with people we don't like. Uh, or experience things that we don't like, like, uh, you know, if my last week, you know, that wasn't fun. So I think what the Buddha said is not that life is only suffering, but that there is suffering in life, right? That's, I think, fundamentally, we can all believe that. I've always felt that you don't have suffering or something, but well, suffering, what? But joy doesn't have the, uh, the same yeah. extreme you need. The, the more the more turmoil and suffering you go through, the more you appreciate the good times. Uh, yeah, if I mean, everything was just it'd be boring. It wouldn't. It, nothing would mean anything. Mm -hmm. So to me, within reason, I need that suffering and turmoil as a measure for it. And and I do think that. Yeah. So. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. People lots of suffering. You can enjoy life. Yeah. Um. And, and I think that that's definitely true. What the Buddhists would say is that, like you say, within reason, right? You added that condition, within reason. And so one of the fundamental qualities that the Buddha talked about was equanimity, of having that balance. So don't experience the extremes, right? Um, and kids are like that, right? Sometimes they're just full of joy and they're... Um, but they then also go through the extremes of like with Nathan, you know, and when he was crying, it was like kind of the worst state he could possibly be. And the Buddha said, always try to have a bit of a balance, right? We know life is going to have moments of suffering and we know life is going to have moments of joy, but try not to make it too extreme either way. And that's what we call equanimity. Um, so the second um, Four Noble Truth is that the cause of suffering, we, he said, is because of our ego and our desires, right? Because we have this self that we believe fundamentally exists, and because we're so focused on our own self, that's what actually causes our suffering. So if we didn't have this attachment to ourself, then we wouldn't suffer as much, uh, or maybe not suffer at all. So I deserve this, I, de you know, I want this, um, why did this have to happen? We wouldn't, sorry, we wouldn't want circumstances to be different. Yes. That's what causes the suffering and internal. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the easy way to remember the causes of suffering, what they call the, um, the three poisons is gas. So greed, anger, and stupidity, or greed, yes. anger, and ignorance. Uh, and so this, this is a, I kept forgetting to point out my cartoons, but so this guy's saying, I want happiness. And the Buddha comes along and he says, well, first remove the ego, which is I, and then remove want, which is desire. And if you remove the I want, then it's happiness. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a brief story, brief, uh, about a fellow in Japan in the 18th century. His name was uh, Sekuro, uh, and he was a Myokonin. I don't know if you've heard that term, Myokonin is someone who is felt to be very close to enlightenment, so a real devoted follower of the Buddhist teaching. Uh, and typically the people who were felt to be Myokoni were uneducated. So they had a, a 
not an academic understanding of Buddhism, but a lived experience of, of Buddhism. Um, so anyways, there's a story about how he was a poor farmer. Uh, one day, all of his belongings or his savings were stolen by a thief. And initially he was angry. Um, and then a villager said, well, I saw who broke into your house. I know who stole your money. And so Sekudo was going to uh, approach this person. And at the moment that he approached him, rather than saying, you know, like, why did you steal or get mad at him? He said, thank you very much for taking my money. And the villager said, well, why did you thank that thief? You know, he stole all your savings. And he said, well, the thief actually, the moment I encountered him, he actually taught me some really good lessons. One is non-attachment. So don't be attached to my belongings, my money. What I say um, uh, um, that I have this flaw that this flaw of a greed, anger, and stupidity or ignorance. Um, and he taught me a lesson that, oh, okay, um, I have these flaws. And so I need to work on trying to reduce these flaws. Um, and then he also said, um, but that thief also acted as a conduit for me to really understand the teachings of the Buddha and so that was um, a situation where um, yeah so this Myoko Nin, this Sekuro was felt to have um, understood that his ego, his attachments um, actually causes suffering and that this thief brought him a little closer to the state of understanding that he shouldn't have his attachments. Okay, so the third noble, I, I like that um, cartoon, the end is insight, or the end is insight. <laughs> Anyways, um, the third noble truth is that there is a way of ending the suffering. And so the Buddha would have said that that way of attaining that end of suffering is to become enlightened, to understand yourself, to lose um, your attachment to yourself. Um, and so many people have likened the Four Noble Truths to uh, going to a doctor, right? So one, you have to understand that you're sick. That's understanding that life has suffering. Two is that what's causing the suffering. So making a diagnosis. So you have a pneumonia or whatever. Uh, you have COVID. Three is that you have to have a belief that you're going to get better. So the doctor is going to say, yes, I can fix you. And the fourth is the treatment which the Buddha said was the Eightfold, uh, Eightfold Noble Path, right? So he said, here's a prescription for how you should lead your life. And if you're able to lead your life in this way, um, then you will gain enlightenment, you will end your suffering. And so um, you guys all know the Eightfold Path. No, so they, we, yeah, so people have heard about it. So the eight, um, ways is the right view, so having the right view, right speech, uh, right thought, um, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right meditation, and right concentration. And I have a little mnemonic of how you can remember those eight. It's not important for you guys, but we had to memorize it, and we had to be able to say them without even thinking about them. So TV Salem C is the way to remember it. Uh, so thought, view, uh, speech, action, livelihood, effort, meditation, and, and, uh, and uh, concentration. Anyways, um, but before we get into that, and this is what I was talking to Harry about a little bit, is what does right mean? Right? Because right is such a generic, a general term. So when the Buddha said right, thought, right speech, was he saying right as opposed to wrong, right? Is it the correct or the uh, morally correct uh, way to speak, for example, if we want, or livelihood, let's talk about livelihood. Is it the right way to earn a living or is it the wrong way to earn a living? Is that the idea? I think he actually meant more true, honorable or pure way of thinking. Because right versus wrong tends to put a judgment on, you know, so, you know, um, a doctor, that's the right livelihood, whereas a pimp, that's the wrong livelihood. Well, 
it seems like that's right. But for that pimp, maybe that way of earning a living is the best thing that they could possibly do given their cir circumstances, right? So I, I don't think it's really meant to be morally correct or uh, you know, right versus wrong. I think it's more true or honorable is the way that I should think about it. Is it more pure? Does that make sense? But it's a world. world. I mean, what's true in one situation is not true in another or honorable, depending on where you live or- uh, Absolutely. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Or who the that. person is even. They sound like Trump that say he's honorable. Yes. Yes. His honorable. Yeah. Or their bar is different from my bar. <laughs> you know what I mean? So how do you? So I think that that's, I mean, that's why I would use those terms, because I think it really does depend on the person's circumstances and situations. Like my father used to say, it depends. You know, is that right livelihood? It depends, right? It depends on what that person's situation is. Um, anyways, that's a question that I've struggled with. Like, I, I don't know that I like the term right speech and right thought because there's so many different ways of interpreting that. I wonder what the word was translated was. I tried to look that up, Harry, actually, specifically for this, but I, I couldn't find it, actually. Oh. But, um, but that would be a really, I'm sure someone's written a thesis on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think he meant politically right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right versus left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought we could go through these a quickly. I, I don't think I want to go through them in any detail. Um, but right speech, for example, um, one of the fundamental things that the Buddha said is if you think about what you're saying, you should think about is it true, is it helpful, and is it necessary? Right. So every time you say something, which is impossible, right? But, um, you know, so, you know, he talks about don't spread gossip, don't lie, don't slander, don't use harsh words against people. Those were some of the fundamental ideas. Um, so right speech, yes. Well, my dad can reach a higher plane of consciousness <laughs> than your dad. Right action. So um, there are five precepts in Buddhism and I won't go through those in detail because I think they make sense. It, do not kill, do not steal, no sexual misconduct. Don't use intoxicants, which is interesting, and don't lie. Um, and so, do you think that you can live your life such without doing any of those things? Without doing it? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, well, I don't know. Like, I'd be a little white lies. <laughs> <laughs> so, white lies? Yeah. <laughs> but what about the, well, okay, would she lie? Yeah, would she lie? So, fundamentally, the Buddha said that you cannot live this life without. Uh, with without committing one or more of the five uh, sins. And what are intoxicants? I mean, uh, so alcohol, drugs. But what are intoxicants to some people and maybe not to others? Sure. Sugar. Yeah. Right. So yeah. some people use yeah. um, marijuana as uh, medical, medical treatment. Medical treatment. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're right. So some of it depends on your definition. But fundamentally, you can't live this life without killing uh, maybe not necessarily another bee because vegans don't, but but they're still killing a life if they're eating vegetables, right? Um, um, I think it would be extremely difficult to not to avoid all of those five things in your life, and that's one of the fundamental things that the Buddha said. That's why life is suffering because you will inevitably commit one of these sins. I mean, some of them are easier right no yeah. sexual misconduct okay and don't steal but again even stealing you know if you took i'll give you an example of how i stole this says buddhist temple of southern alberta and i took it home <laughs> <laughs> is that stealing yeah. <laughs> yeah well <laughs> i'm gonna return it now <laughs> you bring back several things <laughs> yeah. but you didn't intentionally steal that's the difference too is that if you intentionally Oh, I'm going to take this, but if it's a, you know, you accidentally took it out, like he did, when I took that pen from the funeral home when I just said, say, signing, and I, and I said, oh, I got his pen. We went back and dropped it off. Oh, I didn't cool. intentionally steal. Sure. Right. So it does partly depend on your intention. Like you kill, yeah. you know, you step on an app. Well, I didn't know that app even was there, right? I, it was unintentional. Um, so yeah, intent. Part of nature, you're talking vegans, if it's part of nature, 
is that killing? Is that well, like? Well, it, it is, still but, is. But yeah, it is. But so part of it, you're is right. It morally wrong, I guess, because it's right. You know, when the cat eats the most. Is that is that wrong? Well, and we only no. beef or chicken or pork. They they have somebody has to kill it. Are they yeah. sentient? Uh, what like the mouse? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that plants are sentient. <laughs> sentient means that they have a consciousness. I think. A screen when you cut them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? a good, the best example I've seen of plants is you know uh, groves of oak trees, or you know, like if you go to a forest, and there has been definitely scientific understanding that if you chop an oak tree here that it actually has some chemical influences on the oak tree way at the other end of the world, right? Mm. That they are suffering. Okay. I like this cartoon. Okay, you finish reaching good. alignment, you may go to the mall. Okay, uh, I have to hurry. I think that's why the word right might be okay because it just means as long as you're aware of when it happens. Yes. And that's what fundamentally, so it's that awareness is, you know, so if you steal this pen accidentally, uh, or if you say, oh, that's a nice pen, no one will notice, yeah. right? So there's a huge difference in that morally, I think. Uh, I won't go to the gold chain because you guys don't know it. I love the gold chain. Uh, yes. So who, who wrote the gold chain? Like, where did it come from? Uh, so there's a lady in Hawaii. She was a, a Protestant, um, minister's wife in Hawaii. So this is when the first immigrants came to Hawaii, Japanese immigrants, sorry, uh, and were working on a plantation. And she started to study Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. And her and her husband, who was a Protestant minister, both converted to Jodo Shinshu. And she wrote The Golden Chain. It was in about 1910, 1911. And there's, some, there's several versions of it. But I really think that for whatever reason, she captured the essence of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism yeah. with the golden chain, which is amazing. So the golden chain wasn't ever recited in Japan. Like it wasn't part of Japanese culture until it became popular in the U.S. And then people started. So there are translations of the golden chain into Japanese uh, that they've now incorporated in many temples in Japan. But it's one of those innovations that I think that she really somehow managed to capture the true essence of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism in a simple poem. Uh, oh, do you want I'm me to so show it to That we make it part of our service. Like, yeah, so I like it too. Every week. Yeah, so I'm a link in the Buddha's gold chain of love. So that uh, really encompasses the old idea that we're interdependent, right? Uh, stretches around the world in gratitude. And so gratitude is a really fundamental concept. I will keep my link right. So, so I'll do self-effort. I will try my best to make my link nice and bright and shiny and strong. Uh, I'll try to be kind and gentle to everything. Again, the emphasis is on try, right? Because yeah. it's impossible to always be kind and gentle to everything. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that that's necessarily um, necessary, all who are weaker than myself, because I think you have to be kind and gentle to everybody. everybody. Everything. But anyways, I'll try to think pure and beautiful thoughts, to say pure and beautiful words. So it really encompasses some of the Eightfold Path, yeah. right? Um, may every link in a Buddha's golden chain of love become bright and strong. So, uh, and I'm going to talk about that today is, um, oh, going to blank for Hi. sympathetic joy. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Good. <laughs> uh, we're just going through a bit of a class here. And it's pretty generic, eh? I mean, if you took the Buddha part out of it, it... it yeah, it could have to life. I mean, to and any, to any most religion. religion. Yeah. So the lady's name was Dorothy Hunt, anyways. Wow, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I really, again, I think she somehow managed to capture the essence of what Jodo Shinshu is about. Uh, right, livelihood. I won't talk about that. She's still alive. Okay. Oh no, she wrote it in nineteen fifteen or something. Yeah, so it, it was. I think even prior to the Jodo uh, the. Buddhist Temple of San Francisco opening. So it was oh, quite a long yeah. time ago. Uh, can't possibly be thinking about nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go through the other ones. I'll just go through my cartoons. Uh, meditation. 
So that's really interesting that the eightfold path and the six parameters, and I'm going to talk about the six parameters in a second, include meditation. And yet the interpretation of the Jodo Shinshu, like Nishihonganji, our school of Buddhism, the mother temple, had said for about a hundred years, you should not practice meditation or you should not encourage meditation. Now, subsequently, they've changed that to say meditation is okay. Just don't accept, uh, don't expect that you're going to attain enlightenment by meditating. That meta meditation you were talking about last week, I thought, where have I heard that? In yoga. Yeah. They, they say it in yoga all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What is it called? The meta meditation. It's, thing uh, loving kindness meditation. So it's when you think about sending loving kindness first to yourself, then your family, then your acquaintances, then your enemies, and then all beings. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. So right thoughts, um, avoid being greedy, avoid being attached to an outcome, avoid being angry, ignorant. Again, easy to said than done, right? Um, so I just want to contrast six parameters quickly with the Eightfold Path. So they're basically the same, right? But in Mahayana Buddhism, the school of Buddhism that I'm going to talk about next week, uh, they came up with a different set of guidelines, right? And they're basically the same except for there's two additional ones that weren't in the Eightfold Path, and that is giving selflessly, right? So dana, that actually isn't in the Eightfold Path, and, um, and patience. So this is the comparison. So we have these six parameters of what we're saying today, but uh, giving, discipline, patience, endeavor, meditation, wisdom. Uh, so there is no uh, selfless giving in the Eightfold Path. Discipline is speech, action, and livelihood in the Eightfold Path. Patience doesn't exist. Endeavor is effort. Meditation, meditation, and wisdom are in view of thought. So um, most scholars believe that Mahayana Buddhism came up with the idea of the Eightfold, uh, the six paramitas, to be able to incorporate particularly dana, selfless giving. Uh, Couple of other concepts I'm going to talk about really quickly. Um, you guys all know the three treasures. So we talk about the three treasures of Buddhism that is fundamental to all schools of Buddhism. That is that uh, we take refuge, is the proper term, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the Buddha being the historical Buddha. Um, how many Buddhas exist, by the way? Countless. Countless, yeah. Uh, some schools of Buddhism believe that there was only one Buddha. The historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, who lived 2,600 years ago, he was the only Buddha and that there is not going to be another Buddha until Maitreya, the next Buddha, who's going to come into being 5 billion, 600 million years from now. That was the theory. Okay. Mahayana schools like um, the, believe that there are hundreds or thousands of Buddhas that currently exist all around us and that we all become Buddhas when we die. So it depends, but there are some more popular Buddhas and some that are more obscure. Um, the Probably the most well-known Buddha other than Amida or the Buddha and the historical Buddha Shakyamuni is uh, Guanyin, uh, Guanyin or Kanon. Uh, or Avalokiteshvara is the goddess of uh, the Buddha of compassion. Um, and so I don't know if you've ever seen statues of the Kanon. Uh, the Kanon um, has it, one depiction is it has a thousand arms to help a thousand different people all at once. Um, but the way you can tell it's a Kanon is actually in the Junidai, it says Kanon wears upon his crown, although they most people say her crown. Uh, Buddha's image and its precious jewels. So the depiction of Kanno is always on the forehead. There's a little statue of the Buddha. Um, and so um, my dad gave us a really nice statue of Kanno and it, and it doesn't have a thousand arms. It only has 10 arms, but it has the statue of the Buddha on its forehead. So, um, so most Buddhists believe that there are countless number of Buddha that exist. That, because Buddha to become a Buddha means that you've attained that state of enlightenment. Okay. 
And then the third jewel is the Sangha, right? So the fellow congregation, um, the fellow travelers along a spiritual path, that makes sense. Uh, traditionally, the Sangha, the term Sangha was only used for monks and nuns, so the monastics of the practice. And that in order to become a member of the Sangha, you had to give up your secular life, your daily life. Um, but that changed with Mahayana Buddhism because Mahayana Buddhists said, well, everybody's a follower, should be allowed on that path. Okay, so which is the most important treasure for you? You think Buddha, the Dharma, or the Sangha? And people, scholars have written thesis, PhD thesis on the importance of you. Which is the more important? Which need all three And that's what most people conclude. Yeah, that they're all equal yeah, in terms yeah, of importance. One supports the other, which supports the other. Or yeah. the um, but some schools of Buddhists, like Theravadins, uh, some schools of Theravadin Buddhism would say the Sangha is not important because it's an individual practice. I'm going to try and attain enlightenment for myself. Doesn't matter what you guys do. But does that feature ego? That yes. <laughs> so that's <laughs> the whole reason why this other branch of Buddhism developed, Mahayana, is that they were saying, one, that you should be thinking of others, not just yourself. Two, that it's way easier to attain the state of enlightenment with other people than, you know, like studying with other people is way easier than studying with yourself. And so there was multiple reasons why this concept of the Sangha became equally important but the traditional schools of Theravada would have said sangha's way down the list you know the buddha is the most important the teachings are the second most important and the song then they rank them but mahayana school partly developed in reaction to that saying no the sangha's just as important as okay uh okay uh, this is a term that i have the hardest explaining time explaining or understanding so there's this whole concept of emptiness or sunyata. Uh, and that is really one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha, that nothing in this world actually, one, exists on its own, which that's fairly easy to understand, but nothing in this world has a fundamental form of its own. Okay? So that that form is actually not a form. <laughs> yes, um, but if it wasn't for the function of the form, it would be. Can I leave that? Yes, yeah. thanks, Ed. Um, That's what all those t shirts mean. They're, all those t shirts that we were selling, those black ones. Oh, yeah. Um, Eagles, emptiness. It says emptiness. Yeah. We all couldn't oh. figure out what that meant. So, Sunyata is meant <laughs> felt to be a, a really fundamental. Um, so, Nagarjuna, who's considered the first of our seven masters, was the one who really came up with this concept. But he said, nothing, everything in this world is empty or devoid of actual independent form. That's a really, really difficult concept for me to understand. Uh, in the Heart Sutra, the most famous quote from the Heart Sutra is, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form, form is emptiness, so that this doesn't actually exist. So this form is empty. It's not actually there. Um, but this, all of this emptiness, all of this world around you is composed of forms. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll let you think about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really, really difficult concept to both understand and to try and explain. Okay. Uh, the easier one is Tathagatagarbha. Again, uh, around the time of Nagarjuna, many Buddhist scholars started to believe in this concept. It was, uh, and then they went back and say, said many of the Buddha's sutras, the Buddha's sermons, contain components of this concept. That every, and some people would say sentient being, every being, every entity has the potential to become a Buddha. That it has Buddha nature in it. And I, that's a concept that I find easy to accept. Um, that, uh, you know, the best example is the baby, right? When you see a baby, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's like a Buddha, right? That baby is so pure. Um, but it, um, 
But I, I think that that's a concept that is pretty easy for me to understand, especially with when we talk about sentient beings. So like dogs, cats, you know, rats, whatever, have the potential. But people have taken it further and said every entity, so a rock has the potential to become enlightened and become a Buddha. Um, does that make sense, Sachi? No? Okay, so let me give you an example. I'm going to take a piece of rock, okay? This rock which composes different elements. I've used this rock many times to give that example. So does this rock have the potential to become enlightened? Well, it doesn't feel like it's not. It doesn't have a brain, it doesn't live, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't need something. But do you necessarily have to have that in order to gain enlightenment, to become enlightened? The potential for enlightenment, sorry. I thought you had to give up your ego and everything to be yeah, yeah. so ultimately this has it. no ego oh, yeah. right so it's already so the uh, much more simplistic my way of thinking about it is yeah. okay so this is composed of let's say iron right iron becomes part of me is my hemoglobin right mm -hmm. i eat ingest iron um it becomes part of my body it becomes part of my cells well i have the potential to become enlightened would you agree with that maybe not <laughs> but if I do, then surely that piece of iron has that I potential. Do, but I, I, I just don't, I don't see the connection with the rock or something that's an, an object. But if it becomes part of me, would it not have at least the potential to become a light? Would you break it? But the part of you yeah, that's iron, maybe, it, but not that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but what's the difference between the iron here and the iron that's in my ribs? So your glasses can become part of the water. Yeah. So, I mean, so that was the philosophical understanding, though, that some, and not all schools of Buddhism, but some schools of Buddhism said every entity, every being, every uh, molecule, every atom has the potential potential not that they will but they have the potential to become alive i think it's much easier for us to believe every sentient being every yeah. being that has yeah. a consciousness but would you believe that a flower has the potential to become enlightened i don't know it, so it becomes a philosophical question but but uh but i i think that this is something that's easier for me to understand okay and i'm going to finish there just to say that um, these are some of the four. Uh, the, these are the four qualities that the Buddha encouraged for us to try and develop, and that's been part of my Dharma talks. So compassion—that makes sense, right? Um, we should try to be compassionate and think about others. Um, I talked about equanimity, so that balance, that understanding that yes, life is going to have suffering and life is going to have joy, but uh, we should try to maintain the middle ground of trying to stay balanced as much as possible uh, loving kindness so loving kindness or meta was a real important concept that the buddha taught which is try to give um, loving thoughts uh, loving wishes to others and the one that i find the hardest and i'm going to talk about it today my dharma talk is sympathetic joy because that's not one that i had heard growing up um, to feel genuine happiness for harry because he bought a new car um, and not to have that little bit of jealousy you know, or whatever it might be. Um, sympathetic joy is easy if your life is good, right? So if my, if, you know, the way that my life is right now, it's relatively easy for me to be happy for Harry or for Jacob, right? If I'm suffering, if I'm poor, if I'm starving, if I'm, if, if I have a crappy car that, I, you know, like a, uh, my son's Highlander that's got over 400,000 kilometers on it. If I'm driving that and Harry shows up with a new car, I'm, it's much harder for me to be happy for him. Okay. But to genuinely have that happiness for others, that joy for others, it's, it's, I, I didn't understand it as an uh, important Buddhist concept, but the more I think about it, the more I think, well, that's a difficult thing to do. But it is a good thing to, to be able to do. So, so I'll talk about it. The, inevitably, right? I mean, it's so hard to, it's like giving, we call Donna, um, to genuinely give this to you and not have any attachments to you, to it, 
to that process of giving is so difficult, right? Somehow there's in the back of my mind, even if you give it and you know you don't want it back and you genuinely give it, there's always a thought of, oh, aren't I'm a good, a good guy. I gave Greg this nice raw. Right? Do you just see the even if all you want is to see their joy? Yeah. Joy well, that is that's a little bit of you know, that's not pure you giving. Want it so much Right. And in the same way that pure giving is extremely difficult, I think that sympathetic joy of actually genuinely feel it's very similar, right? It's really difficult to be able to. I think parents could do that with their kids because you generally do something for your kid. Differently. Well, but there's always that little bit of attachment, though. And then, and there's that little component of, well, that's my son, you know, that, you know, so I want my son to be happy. But there's a little component of what, and that makes me happy, right? So there's no yeah. such thing as, as a donation, even anonymous donation, because you're getting something in return, is that? Yeah, well, I think it's possible, but it's extremely difficult, right? So to genuinely, I think that there are people who can practice that to a certain extent, a closer to a pure form of giving than I can practice. But it's tough to not have thought of aren't I a good guy or you know I want that tax receipt <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something, yeah. something like that what you're getting you know or somehow even that there's a little recognition in out in the world it's kind of like the and so how many people donate anonymously and then look but then you know like for me it's like did they include my anonymous donation in the hikari uh, oh my name's not there but did they recognize that there was an anonymous donation? You know, that kind of thing. I think it's extremely difficult to give purely without having any attachment to that. Even like my, myself, I'll, I'll go to somebody, some, some homeless person, I'll, I'll give them something. Right. And to me, if I don't tell anybody about that, that is maybe selfless. But now that I think about it deeply, it also is to make myself feel good about right. helping yeah, that guy. Right? Yeah, so, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's, so there's always... Friends, friends are pretty deep. I don't know how you... It's, I think it's... Away from that, yeah, really it's... Really and I think there are moments, like, at that specific moment where you give that thing to that homeless person. Maybe that's an act of peerless giving. But when you think about it, as soon as you start thinking about it, then, you just then it's yeah. it destroyed, yeah. right? That's... Yeah. That purity of that act becomes tainted. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not possible then. Well, I don't know. I think it is possible. Yeah. I think it's just extremely. Those four qualities are encouraged, but not to be practiced. They should just. It's that's the yeah an instinct yeah you're right. So I think that you need to make efforts towards these qualities, right? To try and. Like meta, giving loving kindness is a practice, right? And and I think that, but to expect that you're going to achieve it is unrealistic, right? So can you ever give selflessly? Can you ever feel joy for someone without any attachments? Can you ever, yeah. 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 there's all, so, and that's what the Buddha, and that's what Shinran said, is that you can try and try and try, and it's important for you to try, but his belief was, is that based on your own efforts, you'll never, never achieve that pure giving, that state of enlightenment on your own. There's no way you can do it. And whether that means you have to rely on the Sangha or the compassion of the Buddha. He said fundamentally, well, he didn't say that for other people. He said, fundamentally, I can never achieve this pure state on my own i have to rely and that's why he said uh, the buddha's teaching is so important. Oh, this was an episode of friends <laughs> <laughs> tell me about it one of the few one of the few i remember but i remember that one and what was this is that from the time we're little we're taught like you go to school and you know sharing and stealing and taking and fighting and you know jealousy and all of those things like, i mean to be the true you know, whatever from a very young age just to follow that Right. Yeah. When you go to school, you're, it's all there. It's that jealousy you're growing up with. It. Can you feel joy when somebody gets something that you don't want? Is, does that count? Like if somebody achieves something, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. when you think it's easier, wow, that's great for them. 
because you never wanted that. You never yeah, wanted I, that. Yeah, I guess it's easier that way, but I think. But does that count as sympathetic joy? I, I think so. Yeah. If you have no attachment, you're I, just I, glad I, that they have something or what, but you. you I think, you again, want. there's degrees or there's um, a range of, you know, when is sympathetic joy yeah. pure? Um, oh, pure. Like yes. giving is, you know, there's. In good giving, there's bad giving, you know, you, you have ranges of giving, right? Uh, anyways, I forgot to open with Gasho, but let's close with Gasho. Namami Dabs. Namami Dabs. I hope that was. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have to so take this stuff to, back to the kitchen? Uh, yes, thanks. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's meant to be. It's kind of like, I thought, yeah, oh, that sounds really clear. That's what it's like, oh. Well, you know when they say so, Buddhism is a philosophy more than yeah, a yeah. way of life or philosophy. So, uh, Sachi, to help, the last two sessions we're going to talk about how do we take some of these concepts and make it practical and incorporate it into our everyday life, mm. right? So, I hope that helps because some of these concepts like emptiness, I'm not no sure how much I put, yeah I put, incorporate into my daily life, but some of the concepts is easy. Like, yeah. What's your yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Oh, don't pick up. Pick up yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna make everybody feel guilty. All right. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.